Thank you very much. Thank you much for the invitation, for this kind introduction. Um, you can hear me, I guess. Yeah. Um, we are talking about fashion, but I tried to connect the topic with the general theme of our meeting here about cultures. I read the introduction where I talk about cultures and cultures at work. And that's why I'm talking about fashion, because I think that one of the most of the deep and subtle ways in which cultures work, the way in, in which cultures affect our daily choices, is actually fashion. Fashion has spread, moreover, in our society at the same time which the reflection on culture and on the forms of culture began, like many of the topics we sociology are interested in at the beginning of modernity. We will refer primarily to the 17th century. But fashion, that's one of my points, is subtle, often almost unperceptible, because it is particularly effective when we are not aware of it. We are not aware of its improbability and of the power of fashion in many aspects of our everyday life. But fashion is actually a very complex theme, which involves relevant theoretical questions. And that's something different from what how we usually think about fashion. Fashion in our society is often considered something frivolous, something marginal, something which affects only specific objects, primarily clothing. And as we will see, this is a quite reductive understanding of fashion. And uh, uh, concerning only some people, people who are interested in fashion, only those who follow fashion, and while others, that is the idea, can disregard fashion. And this, as we will see, is kind of false too. The idea that fashion involves only trendy things and fashion of people is somehow reductive, as we said. Um, because it also implies there are people and objects that have nothing to do with fashion. And this is simply not true in our society since a couple of centuries. This is not the case, and that is what was pointed out with great emphasis in the period where fashion began, when fashion was actually born, because fashion did not always exist in the sense we understand it now. Uh, what makes fashion a topic of great, as I think, theoretical interest, and also a quite enigmatic topic, is something which emerged sort of dramatically in the course of the 17th century. Fashion, what man discovered then, then, is fashion is not limited to a few very specific objects, but somehow covers everything and involves everyone, if you want it or not, if you are aware of it or not. Fashion is an extensive and somewhat disturbing phenomenon. It is the goddess of appearances, as Mallarmé, of course, later on, defined. It is a mysterious sort of deity, which is, as it was said at the time, which is the daughter of Saturn and of change, something that makes all of us, here I'm quoting La Bruyere, we will be quoting a lot of, talk a lot about La Bruyere here, makes all of us crazy and unstable, and reveals the puzzles, but also the fascination of modern culture. And we come back here to our topic of culture. Fashion teaches us many things about the transparency and the fascination of, for example, the modern form of individuality. And does it, that's a particular feature of fashion, in an apparently frivolous way. And exactly, therefore, may be particularly effective. But as we said, fashion did not always exist. And until the beginning of the 17th century, there was not even expression to refer to fashion. Only then, only at the time, um, the female French term la mode was distinguished from the masculine le mode, which was much older, and referred to the field of modalities. It's not, not by chance that fashion has this origin connected with modality. Modalities are a field of concept, concepts that which have to do with the possible, the necessary, the transitory, the transient. And, well, fashion, as we see, has something to do with all of these problems. And at the same time, a little Later, also the English fashion arose and the corresponding terms for fashion in the, in the European languages. And together with the terms, arose also a lively debate, a very lively debate at the time, uh, on the interpretation and the consequences of fashion. A very serious word debate, which is, if you look at it, very different from today's carelessness, with which we, with, uh, with we talk about fashion, about the manifestation of fashion. For us, as I said, fashion is often considered something frivolous, something marginal, something which 
the concern, especially women, and that's not understood as a phrase in the debate about that. And the concern is mostly clothes. When we think about fashion, we think about clothes first. In the 17th century, on the contrary, it was very different. Fashionable people were primarily men, and fashion involved not only clothing, and not only the way to appear, but every possible object. That was, that worried, for example, La Bruyere at the time. He complained that when fashion spreads, everything seems to be governed by fashion. Clothes, of course, but also life, taste, lifestyle, health, and consciousness. Fashion dictates, of course, the shape of clothes, the shape of wigs, what people were wearing at the time, men, exactly, but also what to eat, which medicines to use, what feeling to experience and to manifest, philosophical orientation, and especially the attitude to, towards religion, that was La Bruyere's worry, whether to be devout or libertine, as they said at the time. So fashion appeared as something very serious, enigmatic, and extremely worrying. And the best mind of the time, time discussed fashion, were concerned with it. So La Bruyere, as we said, but also, for example, many others, um, Pascal, Baldassar Gracian, La Rochefoucauld, and then later Kant, Hegel, and many others. But why? What emerged in the 17th and 18th century to arouse, arouse so much interest and so much alarm about fashion? Certainly, as I said, not simply the interest for clothes, because the interest of clothes has always been there. The formula, the clothes make the man, dates back to Quintiliano, as everybody knows. And also, it has always been known that clothes change. Not only clothes are important, but clothes change, as well as, as the discussion was, everything in the world. Already Tertullian, in Roman time, spoke of that. And Baldassare Castiglione, for example, a couple of centuries before the time of fashion, also discussed the need to be wise, the need to follow custom and circumstances. Because in a different place, I'm quoting more or less from Baldassare Castiglione, in a different place, in different times, things look more and less convenient and more or less attractive. And that's normal. That's something we have to adapt to, we should conform to. So the topic were all widespread and old, old, but all that is not yet fashion. Fashion, as it began at the time, 17th century, introduced a completely different way to look at the criteria by which we judge things. And indeed, fashion changes the criteria themselves, the criteria we orient in the world somehow. And this is the problem, my, the title of my speech refers to, in and out. That's fashion. The criteria of fashion are not the beautiful or the ugly, the appropriate, the convenient, the right and the wrong, as it happened in all previous centuries, and it happened also in the discussion about clothes, about the changing of clothes and the change of everything in the previous time. Fashion, as we very well know actually, is not beautiful, it's not comfortable, has not to be comfortable, it's not convenient. Those who follow this criteria, who, for example, follow something which is comfortable, do not follow fashion. Fashion is in or out. And the strange thing is that, or fascinating thing if you want, is that something is in, even if, precisely if, we know very well that it will soon inevitably be out. But as far as it is in, as far as it is fashionable, it works as a reference. We follow it. We really like the things that are in, they are in fashion. Uh, and the sense of what is in deeply refers to what is out, it has no other meaning. In is in because it's opposed to out, actually. It has no other meaning. Uh, fashionable things that take the place of other things that now are out of fashion. And we already know in the moment where we follow fashion that what is in now will be out when other things will be in. And that will happen very soon. Actually, tomorrow, they will already be out. And uh, a design like Coco Chanel, for example, who was not a theoretician, but she knew very well this feature of fashion. She said that fashion is there in order to go out of fashion. And this is actually the meaning of fashion, transitoriness, transience. And this is what 
came out in the 17th century. This is a fundamental change that enormously affected the concerned the observed 17th century. They wondered, how did world and society change if our choices and our preferences are driven by something that is not stable but changes, and we know it? Something that relies only on transience from in to out, where transitoriness itself becomes a value. Fashion goes by, and we know it, but it works nevertheless. Even if we know that it passes, it still works. And not only that, it works precisely because of that, because it goes out of fashion. Earlier in uh, traditional societies, in the age of Kutum, according to Gabriel Tad, which were not age of mode, not age of fashion, things were completely different. That's why fashion was sort of a scandal when it came out. Something was light, something was followed, because it was considered beautiful, right, significant. A dress, but also, and above all, moral and religious orientation. And one didn't change opinion from one year to the next. One followed the style and the theory because one was convinced that they were the correct ones. And that they were correct, if they were correct, they should be correct today, but also yesterday and also tomorrow. And those who disagreed were actually wrong. Or one knew that one would say oneself could be wrong, oneself could be make a mistake. But then the other could convince you, because what was right was only one thing. Criteria, in order to be valid, had to be unique, stable, and the same for everyone. Things were as they were, remaining identity the passage of time. Some, someone else, of course, could see them differently from another point of view, another point of view in space or in time, but he would still observe the same thing. And if the various observers were not wrong, the different observations would be coordinated with each other. With each other. The world, however complex and however incomprehensible from the limited perspective of men, was stable and was ordered. That's summing up of the the, um, the, the picture at the time. Well, fashion breaks this order. When you follow fashion, you follow a trend and appreciate something th certain things, not because they are beautiful or because they are right, but only because they are in. Knowing that you didn't like them last year and you will not like them next year and knowing that the others do exactly the same. So nobody says, nobody thinks actually that something like low-rise jeans or asymmetrical haircuts, as we see these years, are beautiful in a sort of absolute sense. Or they are more beautiful than other cuts of pants or other styles of haircuts or something that nevertheless today we would never wear. Not because they are less beautiful, it's something completely different. We don't know that the trends of fashion are, we don't think that, they, don't think that the trends of fashion are beautiful, but nevertheless, we like them, we really like them. So fashion affects deeply and sincerely, in a sense, our relationship with things, and does it without relying on any criteria, only on the mysterious sort of vanishing conditions that these things are in. Four thinkers like, like La Bruyere or Pascal, so we're going back now to the 17th century, this, of course, we can understand it was a scandal. They rightly saw that the orientation to fashion makes marked a sort of a cut, a cesura in modern society, and a fundamental change in the relationship with the world, a fundamental change in our culture, which we still are living in nowadays. They regarded that, regarded fashion altogether, as a sign of madness and unreason. Not a fun, but as I said all the time, a passion. Something, something which is violent and irresistible, which is dangerous, which is the index of moral decay. I'm quoting again Prati La Bruyere. So how could we justify, justify that even fundamental things like religion and morality were guided by the frivolity of fashion? Now, in our society, La Bruyere again, we have to do with men which are different from the men of previous society. Men become restless, inconstant, and light. 
men who proclaim to be devo devotees, for example, but become libertines as soon as you turn your head, and then they get devotee again when fashion changes. How can you rely on such men and on such society or such a culture? Fashion, for example, is different, different from virtue, because virtue remains always the same, while fashion always changes, because it doesn't follow criteria like quality or morality, uh, but something which is much more mobile, much more complex, something which became, not by chance, the label of modern society, and that the men of the time could not understand. Fashion follows only novelty. That's the point of fashion. Fashion doesn't have to be beautiful. It only has to be new. That is different, uh, different from, what was, from what was there before, which becomes old. What was there before, what was in, becomes out and becomes also old. That's a strange feature of modern society. And because these things get old when something new appears. Before that, before the appearance of the new, what was there, was neither new nor old, was simply what it was. Before I buy a new sweater, the one I was using before was not the old sweater, was just the green one or the soft one or the one something gave me as a present. Now it becomes the old one, or more related to marketing. Marketing people know very well that the introduction of a new model of the car make the previous one the old model. And it was just the car that was there before, but now it becomes the old one. So the new produces the old as a side effect which is unavoidable. It is novelty that makes things old. And fashion, fashion which pursues novelty, follows this process, makes the world grow get older and older, but it also somehow mysteriously makes itself get old. So fashion must always be new and continually produces old things. But it also forces to always change itself. Because fashion, if you think of it, when fashion is successful, it gets familiar, it is not old and new. Therefore, it must be overcome. The really knower, the connoisseurs somehow of fashion, have already banned on this fashion and are following a new trend. So in the moment of the greatest success, fashion has already gone and something new is getting in a continuous movement, and we are used to it. But if we think of it from a certain distance, we can see that this obsession for newness, for novelty, is a very strange attitude. And indeed, it appeared, I'm going back to 17th century again very shortly, it appeared incomprehensible to the men of the 17th century. Because in former society and the world in which they, were, they lived, novelty was not appreciated nor it was looked for. Nobody looked for novelty. Nobody evaluated, appreciated novelty. Um, what mattered, what was worth, what was valuable, was not novelty, because novelty is something which, is, which has just arrived, has not been verified, it's not guaranteed, it's unknown, it's threatening, it's disturbing. What mattered the old form of society, what was had been tested and consolidated by experience, by the sacred text, by tradition, something that you knew and you couldn't trust. So the old, and certainly not the new. So when novelty appeared, it was first of all a nuisance, something disturbing, something which forced you to review the established forms and the established criteria and produced uncertainty. So novelty should be avoided as far as possible, ignoring it, stigmatizing it, and if you couldn't do anything else, ascribing it to already familiar forms, so the idea that it looks new, but actually it's not new. It's a variant of something we already know and maybe we forgot. And memory was, a, of course, a very, very important topic in this field. Uh, so something we already actually knew, we forgot, so we don't have actually to review everything when novelty comes in. A sort of a complex way of neutralizing novelty. And that goes on for a long time. Uh, Montaigne, quite late, at the end of the 16th century, still explicitly said that, said, I'm quoting, I don't like novelty in every form. In all things except in the evil ones, change must be dreaded, change must be avoided, novelty must be neutralized as far as possible. But suddenly, we are talking of the end of the 16th century, in a few decades, the attitude completely changes. In the 17th century, novelty is liked, is wanted, is looked for in every aspect of life, 
radically different approach, which becomes a distinctive feature of modern society. Not by chance, as everybody knows here, the German word for modern, modern is Neuzeit, so literally the new time modernity. So the time where, when for the first time, Novet is appreciated, and in this sense is different than in all previous society that now and only now become traditional societies. So societies, societies that worshipped and perpetuated tradition. That, as I said many times, was a scandal, but the scandal was even bigger. For example, Grenai, the author of a much quoted book on fashion in the 17th century, observed an even deeper aspect that not only now novelty is appreciated, but only novelty is appreciated. Not only you appreciate novelty, but novelty becomes a required quality of everything which has to be light appreciated. So novelty becomes, and is still there more or less in our society in many fields, becomes a criterion for excellence in all areas. A sort of a criterion that comes before all content. In art, most of all, in the media, of course, but also in politics, well, I cannot avoid quoting, uh, referring to Italian politics at the moment, uh, but even in science, first you, do, you look if something is new, and then if it's good, then to its qualities. So something is liked, in a sense, if it is new, and only then, only if it, you find out that it's new, look if it's well done, if it has positive effects, and so on. That's kind of crazy attitude, because novelty, per se, novelty by itself, is a sort of non-criterion criterion. It's sort of an empty criterion that doesn't tell us anything about the object at stake. It only tells us that something is different from what was there before and different from what we are familiar with. But not that it is good or that it is useful. Who guarantees that novelty per se is better? Nothing. We don't know it, and we don't, don't, do not even believe it, as we see in the case of fashion. This is not a point. Novelty, to some extent, seems to justify itself. Fashion, which radicalizes the new, new search for novelty, clearly shows, in a more evident way, this quite improbable dynamics. Fashion, as we saw, doesn't have to be beautiful, but only to be different from, from, what, from what was there before. Hence, fashion has to be tendentially provocative, has to be deviant. Therefore, there's a sort of perverse dynamics going on because the form of fashion as we know, now we're referring to clothes, but because in every field where fashion has a role, the forms of fashion becomes more and more extreme. So we always look for a new novelty. But in order to be new, this novelty um, has to be always more radical and more surprising because all the other forms have already been used in the history of fashion. So we look for a newer novelty until the attitude sometimes gets reversed. That's more or less the world we are moving in now because if everyone looks for novelties as we do nowadays, the search for novelty is no longer new, it's no longer surprises. Provocation becomes predictable. This is particularly evident in clothing, but as in many fields, in many other fields as well, we know it. No extravagant dress, no dizzying high heels, no bold nudity appears, for example, as provocative as Prada's apparent normality. But this attitude cannot be repeated too much as well. And this happens in all areas, maybe in a less obvious ways than in fashion. So the search for novelty has this strange effect. It must face a sort of self-produced effect of weariness. You get used to the new. And to go on being surprising, you have to move to an even higher level of provocation, a higher level of deviance. So we look now for a kind of reflexive novelty, which not only deviates from what is familiar, but deviates in a different way, deviates from deviation itself in order to reproduce a sort of astonishment, a sort of surprise, and of course it's difficult development. So it is not enough to be new, it's not enough to renew, you must renew in a new way. And then inevitably, this search for novelty tends to fold on itself. When we expect deviance, or originality, or novelty, the one who deviates and the one who renews actually does what was expected. 
That is, the fo you follow the rule. If the rule is to be always new, if you are new, you follow the rules. So to deviate from deviance is not deviant anymore, because that is what is expected. Changing continuously, you actually always do the same. And that's the problem of fashion, which is theoretically quite complex. So summing up, fashion came out as a sort of outrageous and very complex phenomenon which burst into traditional societies, changing all references and causing huge discomfort, enormous worries at the time. Fashion signals, what was discussed, what people were really aware of at the time, signaled the prevalence of appearance on substance, of common opinion, so what the other like on authority, of transitoriness on stability. So fashion announces, not by chance, a social order which is radically different from the order of tradition, the society we are living in, the culture we are living in now. Something which affects also our big and small everyday decisions and changes our relationship with the world and with all things in the world. I'm sort of emphasizing it in order to point out a strange effect because now one could ask why, how? How was it possible that fashion became the widespread and completely normalized phenomenon we know we are facing now, something we even consider trivial? How does fashion really work in our society? First, we have seen that fashion is followed not despite its changes, but precisely because it changes. So an, an object which is always equal to itself, which remains always the same, cannot be trendy, cannot be fashionable. At most, it will be a classic, and the classic is never related to, well, related to fashion, but it's never fashionable. So even when fashion returned to past forms, to past fashion, to vintage, or for example, like it was in the last time to the style of the 70s, for example, in order to be fashionable, you have to point out that you did not always dress that this way. That is, you have to point out that you follow fashion, which is somehow independent from the forms. For example, my daughter, who is 16 now, dresses more or less how I dress at her age, because fashion went back in the last time to the same forms. But I, myself, I wouldn't be fashionable if I had been, had been wearing for decades uh, the same clothes. Fashion always changes, and we know it. We expect it to change, and we rely on this change. And this produced, once again, a curious paradox. Fashion is full of paradoxes. Fashion made of change a stable principle. In this constantly changing world, the only thing we can rely on, the only thing that, that doesn't change is change itself. In the age of fashion, change is the only remaining stability, a sort of institutionalization of the ephemeral, as Lipovetsky said. And Lipovetsky studied fashion exactly from the viewpoint of this evanescence, in a sense. Change becomes, in our society, the only constant, the only stability, the only things we can, in a sense, rely on. But still, how do we recognize what is fashionable and what is old-fashioned? How do we recognize where trends go in this com continuously moving world of uh, culture and of fashion? Of course, we look at the others. Fashion is that is well known, and not by chance it starts with modernity, is an inherently social phenomenon. No one is fashionable alone. Fashion implies deeply the observation of what the others observe and the complicated game of reciprocal, reciprocal links between observers. So the reference to the others replaces the reference to authority that was, was worrying at the beginning of fashion authority gets, in a sense, weakened or has to become, become much more flexible in the age of fashion. And fashion imposes a completely different way to build models and to orient to models. In fashion, we look at what the, the others, we look at what the others do, but we cannot simply copy them. We cannot, we cannot simply imitate them. The form of imitation of fashion is completely different from the traditional form of imitation. Fashion, of course, has to do with imitation, but with a very, very peculiar, radically new form of imitation. You do not just imitate models, as people once imitated in traditional societies, for example, the great authors of the literary and philosophical tradition, Platon, Petrarch, Caesar or Virgil. 
that was imitation, but it was a different kind of imitation. You had so to try to reproduce the models. While in fashion, the simple reproduction is not good. Balzac, for example, always quoted, mentioned it. The one who perfectly reproduces the model, the one who is perfectly fashionable, is not interesting, is not a, a good example of fashion. You have to deviate, in a sense, to the models. Um, Georg Simmel, a great sociologist, uh, studied fashion now more than a century ago exactly from this point of view. Looking at fashion, we follow models, but not in order to do the same as the others. We are not in order to do the same as the models, but in order to do something different. That's a particular form of imitation realized by fashion, that we imitate not to be like the others, but to be different. This is a very curious form of imitation that leads all of us to do more or less the same, but each trying to be different. We all do the same, but try to be different. We follow the model of fashion in order to distinguish ourselves, not in order to do the same. And that's, this is another really peculiar, strange feature of, of modern culture. We all, as individuals, would like to achieve and to express our individuality, our originality. That what, that what makes us unique and special. And we want, we would like the others to accept it. And we do it with the detail, with the combination of colors, with the variation of fashionable forms that, are, that must be at the same time recognizable as fashionable and original as our own, the same and the different at the same time. For example, we wear the same shoes that the other are wearing, but of a different color, or combined with something else. We all know the subtle devices we use in following fashion. So diversity in fashion must be somewhat be the same in order to be appreciated. The new, in a sense, must be a little bit old. Otherwise, we wouldn't recognize it. We would appreciate it in its novelty. A perfect original would be incomprehensible. Typical literary example is uh, uh, Rameau's nef nephew, the nephew de Rameau, in the, the famous novel uh, story by Diderot. Um, someone which is an absolute original, but looks at weird, not uh, as something positive. The, a perfect original is weird, is unpredictable. He wouldn't be appreciated and certainly would not be imitated. So the original, the positive sense, the positive sense of our modern culture is one who does not copy anyone, but is imitated by everyone. Like a genius in the typical romantic sense. So in order to be imitated, the original must be recognizable by others. And fashion offers the force to do it without having to be geniuses. Because we know the condition of a genius is sort of a heavy condition. It has many burdens, not a happy life somehow. But following fashion, we can, in a sense, achieve the same result without this burden, without suffering the problems of the genius. Um, through fashion, we can follow in a sense a form of novelty, which allows to combine uniformity with difference. Fashion is the same for everyone, but we all feel somehow different. And we follow fashion, paradoxically, in order to express and to show our diversity. And this is, again, another peculiar paradox of modern culture. We are in Norbert Elias' society of individuals, if you want, in which everyone strives for self-realization, for the development of his unique specificity. Every individual wants to be an individual, different from anyone else, every one of us. So every individual is different from all others and wants to express this originality. A very deep basic condition which involves every one of us, it's, which is, from a sociological point of view, unavoidable in our society. It's not a mistake, it's really necessary in our society to have this strange construction, which no one of us is willing to give up. We all wa really want to be original, to be individual. And what is the paradox in this condition? You already imagined it, but in the fact that we all want to be original, and we recognize the same aspiration to everyone else. So we, we acknowledge that all the others legitimately want to be original. So the result is in this search for originality, in this desire for originality, each one is equal to all others. So nothing is as an original as the desire to be original, because we all want it. 
And that's, of course, again, quite a problem. And here, fashion again comes in, because fashion is a very effective tool that our society puts at our disposal in order to fulfill this ambition, using, in a sense, neutralizing this paradox, this all spread desire for originality. And that's the reason why, and we come back to the beginning of, our, of my talk, that's um, why fashion has to concern every object and every person. Because fashion works precisely because nobody can ignore it, and everybody knows it. Here I quote for the last time the Bruyere, whoever shies away from fashion is as weak as the one who follows it. Nobody can avoid fashion. And of course, we know there are people who pretend to ignore fashion. We all know some of them. Maybe some of us all said, I don't follow fashion. But if you look carefully at this sort of attitude, I don't follow fashion, it comes out that this claim not to follow fashion requires great attention and great effort. So quite the opposite of this interest for fashion. I speak from out of my experience, but you probably all had this experience. Try to buy a sweater as a present for one of these persons who don't follow fashion. You can be quite certain that they will never use it. Because the one who refuses fashion does not actually wear anything. Doesn't, there's another people who doesn't care about what he wears. They apply very strict criteria to select what he or she can wear and what is not accepted. And what is not accepted is practically everything. So not being fashionable requires great care and a great deal of attention for fashion, even if in a negative sense. So nobody, as uh, uh, Mallarmé said, can elude the power of this goddess of appearances, in positive or in negative. So in fact, that's not surprising, because in fact, we all have to face the problem and the eternal puzzles of individuality, which are never solved. Individuality is never solved as a problem. And actually, I would say it's even good so. The charm, the fascination of society, society, of society relies on this endless exploration, the exploration of this never fulfilled individuality in ourselves and the others. And in looking for that, we inevitably refer to the others and we observe how they observe, how they observe us. Erwin Goffman, as we have all know, endless studies sort of phenomena. Um, so that's, this development individuality is a, in an in unresolvable task, and in this task, fashion provides us with very effective, very complex tools, much more than we are aware of. And the tools of fashion, as we have seen now, are largely paradoxical tools. Only a fashion, for example, having novelty as its only content, that is emptiness, no content, we have seen it, can leave room can express this in endless indeterminacy, or if you want, the freedom of individuality. Therefore, for example, something like a comfortable fashion is nonsense. If you follow fashion because it's comfortable, you actually don't follow fashion. The reason, for example, one year we wear very comfortable shoes like Birkenstock in Germany or something like that, is exactly the same while the following year we wear very uncomfortable high heels. Actually, no reason. Because that's what, Goff, uh, what um, Zimmel said. The reason of fashion is actually no reason. He spoke of ab abstractness, but the point is, fashion has, needs to have no reason. And only continuously changing fashions allows us to go on in this search for individuality without having to face the paradox of originality, without realizing actually that we follow fashion like everyone else in order to be different from, from everyone else. Because as far as fashion, that's why fashion has to change. Because as far as fashion is new, we don't notice this paradox. We don't notice we are doing exactly as all the others. Because fashion, in the moment it comes out, in the moment it's new, is actually new. It is different. It's original. The forms and the trends of fashion are amazing. We are surprised by it. And when fashion is established, when we start somehow to recognize the uniformity of fashion, when we start to see that the originality we are trying to develop following with fashion is the same as the one of everyone else, and we actually are wearing all the same, feeling different, then fashion has already changed. And produces shows us new novelties we have to adapt to. So a new challenge in, we, in which we can still look at the others and look at the other, we look at ourselves, at our, as I said, endless look for self-development. 
And in this sense, we could say that the complexity of fashion, because fashion is really, as maybe you have seen, a very complex phenomenon, reflects and feeds, in a sense, the complexity of modern society and the complexity of modern culture and modern cultures, as we have in the title of our meeting. So the relationship with the world is always played by each of us on multiple dimensions that intertwine and affect each other. The continually, continuously changing world in which we are never alone, a world that can never be reached and can never be definitely known, and it's always, therefore, infinitely fascinating, but probably always in the form of a paradox, and that's one of the deep aspects of our cultures. Thank you. Thank you.